Hey there, my name is Charles Amont, and welcome to Test Driven Development in Unity. Throughout this series, I will be demonstrating the test driven development process in Unity by implementing a heart based health system, much like the health systems found in the Zelda franchise. In part one, we started off the series by doing some hands on experimentation in the Unity player. Through this style of prototyping, we decided that we would implement the user interface aspect of the health system using Unity's built in UI image class. Having a rough idea of our implementation, we began work by coding the replenish method. In part two, we will use TDD to start chipping away at the deplete method. We'll refactor some duplication out of our tests, and we'll write a script to see the fruits of our labor in action. Let's get started. So the first thing we'll do is update our running to-do list by deleting what we accomplished in part one, and adding anything we've come up with since. This is just a little productivity tool that I picked up from Kent Beck and Eric Dietrich, and it's certainly optional and not required by test-driven development. In this case, I'd like to add an item to remind me that the heart class should be in its own file. Um, I don't have to do this right now, but it's on the list for later. Once that's been added, we can move on to implementing the deplete method. The deplete method operates very similarly to the replenish method. It'll accept an integer that represents the number of heart pieces to be depleted, where each heart piece will lower the image fill amount by 25%. Even though I have a clear idea of what I'm going to write and how I'm going to test it, I'd still like to go through the motions one more time. To begin, we'll drive our implementation forward by writing the assertion first. This is a great way to start, especially for cases when you aren't sure how to proceed and the implementation details are still fuzzy. I at least know that deplete is going to lower the fill amount of our image, so the base case will be to assert that the image fill amount remains at 1 when the method is passed a 0. So in a moment, I'll have a finished test that doesn't compile. Now I got a few questions in part 1 about this. Does a non-compiling test count as a failing test? Is this a valid technique? The answer is yes. Non-compiling tests are absolutely a part of the red-green refactor cadence that is unique to test-driven development. We can see here that my test is not compiling because a heart is nested within the replenish method class, so it's not available to the deplete method class. I'll fix this and drive my production code forward just a little bit by moving the heart class into the outer scope, making it visible to the replenish method class. This is another important aspect of the red step in red-green refactor, doing the smallest amount of work to get your test to pass. Now that heart is in scope, the next smallest unit of work I can perform to get our test to pass would be to create a stub for the deplete method. I'm going to set it up with a parameter name I like and leave the body empty. This will give us a passing test because in our base case we aren't going to perform any computations. Passing zero to the deplete method should have no effect on the UI image's fill amount. With this small change, I now have a valid test and I can give it a, an appropriate name. Luckily for me, the replenish method performs a similar job so I can reference the test that I have already written. I'm also going to reference the replenish method class's setup logic in order to avoid some instantiation duplication. In the future, we'll explore a more advanced style of instantiation called data builders. Data builders allow you to be more expressive and clear about the state of your class under test along with its collaborators. For now, however, we'll stick to class properties that are common enough that they'll allow us to remove even more duplication pretty shortly. Now one thing you may have noticed is that I've committed a bit of a TDD sin by refactoring before I ran my tests. Truly, I should have confirmed that they were green before moving to the refactor step of red-green refactor, but we'll just use it as a learning experience. I got lucky this time around and the tests were green, but if they had failed, then refactoring might have made debugging more difficult. You always want to test fast and test often. Fortunately, I'm going to sort of redeem myself here with a quick refactoring. I had started working on the next test before it dawned on me that I named this first test method in terms of the value assigned to image fill amount, whereas I named the replenish methods test in terms of fill percentage. Naming is an important aspect of your unit test suite. You should try to stay consistent as much as possible. This time around, I've already run my tests and I know that they are passing. 
Armed with that knowledge, I can make my name change and rerun my test to prove that I haven't broken anything. Hopefully, this is enough to redeem myself this time around. Everything still works, so I can move on with confidence. Moving right along with Red Green Refactor, let's continue by writing our next failing test. By this point, things are starting to become a little repetitive. We've got an obvious implementation that we're pretty confident in, so really, this next test will serve mostly as a vehicle for getting that implementation into our production code. Now, I've mentioned this term, obvious implementation, before, and I'd like to give it a better explanation. The green step in Red Green Refactor is all about coming up with the simplest way to make your test pass, even if that means hard coding a return value. This pushes your development effort forward iteratively and can be extremely helpful for building algorithms that are complex and difficult to see at first. But when you already know what your algorithm is going to be, it's perfectly fine to skip a few steps and just introduce it to your code in one shot. That's exactly what I'm referring to when I say the obvious implementation. In this particular case, our obvious implementation will be to decrement images fill amount by the number of heart pieces multiplied by the fill per heart piece. We'll drop that into the method stub and turn those tests from red to green. Now that that's in place and passing, we can do some refactoring. Refactoring seems to be the most neglected step in the red-green refactor cadence, and really in software development in general. But I see a perfect candidate for it in the duplication found in our setup method and class properties. The strategy we're going to use will be to pull the initialization up into the heart test class, and then have the replenish method and the deplete method classes inherit from it. This may seem unnecessary, but for the most part, duplication should absolutely be taken care of as soon as possible, as it can very easily lead to bugs. For example, I could add an optional parameter to the heart class's constructor, and not account for that in either one of my test classes. A contrived example, yes, but not at all outside of the realm of possibility, and one that could cause my tests to fail unexpectedly. And as with all refactorings, I need to run my test suite to ensure that everything is still working as I expected. Our tests passed, so now we can move on. At this point, you might be wondering what to do next. Personally, I don't feel like we've written enough tests for the deplete method. I won't feel comfortable until I cover at least a few more states and input values. But can't we move on to the next item on our to-do list? The algorithm is in place, and the whole point of test-driven development is to drive the creation of source code, right? Well, the answer really is that it depends. Your final product should definitely be backed up by a full suite of automated tests. So the question isn't if you should write the rest of the tests, but rather when you should write the rest of the tests. And that is fully up to you. I have a pretty bad short-term memory, so I know I'll forget. Plus, there's no rule in TDD against writing passing tests for existing code, so I'm just going to go ahead and write them now. Don't worry though, we can skip ahead. The deplete method exists now, so I'll mark this item as complete. The meat of both the replenish and deplete methods are done for now, but we still haven't addressed negative values. Like I mentioned in part 1, we want the replenish and deplete methods to throw an exception for negative values. This shouldn't be too difficult, so we'll take this time to knock these two items off the list before we move on to bigger and better things. Part of the course with test-driven development, we'll start off by writing a failing test. The assertion for this is pretty straightforward. nUnit's helper method accepts an exception type and a closure that contains the code that will throw the expected exception type. In our case, we're going to expect an argument exception and call deplete with negative 1. As I fumble around trying to figure out why this code is giving me an error, I'll take this time to mention that these are live coding sessions with minimal editing. I wanted to keep them as raw as possible to show what my real process looks like, warts and all. Somehow, I forgot to indicate a return type, and it took me a second to catch it. But uh, everything is compiling now, and our test is failing, so we can move on. The next thing to do will be to actually throw the exception when number of heart pieces is less than zero. Originally, I had chosen argument exception, but in a moment, Resharper is going to do some auto completion, and it's going to provide me with a more accurate exception throw, which is argument out of range exception. For now, though, I'm going to do my due diligence and fill in the message string along with the param name string. 
Uh, this is just to provide me a little more feedback if something does go wrong. If somewhere else in my code I accidentally pass in a negative number, or maybe another developer is working on this in the future, and uh, they pass in a negative number, they might not even be aware of it. Their algorithm might not check for negatives, and uh, this will be a good way to just give them some information. This is one of the things I like about ReSharper because it has a way of teaching you things that you didn't even know. Um, when I first started doing Unity, I, I had no real um, experience with C Sharp. All of my experience had been with Java at the time, a couple years ago. And uh, by just coding and using ReSharper, I was able to very rapidly learn details about the language that uh, may have taken much longer to pick up. As a part of the process of learning from ReSharper or any tool that offers suggestions or code completions, you really want to look up and understand why it's offering those suggestions. So in this case, I'm going to add to my to-do list that I want to look up the argument out of range exception. Now that that's on the to-do list, we can update our tests and rerun them to ensure that they're failing for the reason that we expect. Once we've got a failing test like we do here, I can add new production code. I'm going to do that by commenting out what ReSharper filled in for me. And I'm going to adjust it so that it's checking that number of heart pieces is only less than zero. Alright, I rerun my tests and they're passing, so we can move forward. Now that the deplete method is complete, we can move on to the replenish method. Here's one of the few cases where I'm actually going to advocate copy and pasting code. The replenish method and the deplete method are pretty similar, so for this next test, I'm just going to copy what we did for the deplete method. Now, in most cases where you have copy and pasted code, most developers will ask themselves, where can I remove the duplication? And as far as the replenish and deplete method goes, we probably could extract out some duplication. For instance, I can combine the two into a single method called set number of heart pieces, but I don't want to compromise the ease of use of my API. By using very domain-specific language with replenish and deplete, I provide a certain abstraction that I think is going to be more beneficial in the long run. Now that my implementation has been copied and pasted in place, I can rerun my test suite to make sure that it works as I thought it would. I run all within Unity's test runner, and everything is still green, so we're good to go. The next thing I'll have to do is update my to-do list and get started on moving the heart class into its own file. I use ReSharper to perform this refactoring, um, but make the mistake of not moving heart into the outer scope first. So when it moves it to its own file, it's still nested within heart tests. But I can just use the, the hot key for moving the class into the outer scope, and we're good to go. It was a quick fix. The great thing about having a pretty solid set of tests is that now I can perform this refactoring and rerun my test suite to ensure that nothing is broken. In a much larger pro uh, project, doing things like renaming, uh, moving classes into separate namespaces and files can be pretty scary. But when you can run your tests and ensure that everything is green, it definitely uh, alleviates the pain. Everything is still passing. A heart class looks good in its own file, so we can move on to the last item on the to-do list, which now we're going to have a little bit of fun. Um, the great thing about doing game development in Unity and working with Unity is that you can literally see the fruits of your labor. So we're going to throw together a class. I'm going to call it the app class. And in it, we're going to bootstrap a heart with an image and I'm going to accept some input that's going to allow me to call the replenish and deplete methods. Now, I'm not going to follow red-green refactor cadence for this, or test-driven development, because this is purely throwaway. Technically, I could if I wanted to, but I'll be doing this throughout the life of this project. And this app class will be updated pretty frequently. It's going to have a lot of throwaway code, but it's going to have just enough code to allow me to see my heart class in action. So, like I said, we're going to bootstrap heart, 
and I'm going to provide a serialized field that's going to uh, allow me to inject the image. And I'm going to accept the inputs from the up arrow and the down arrow. On the up arrow, I would just call replenish and pass in one. And on the down arrow, I'm going to call deplete and pass in one. This is not um, a robust test here. This is just for my own gratification to actually see the heart being affected. It's completely personal preference if you want to do this or not. It's completely optional. But I thought I would just leave this part in here uh, because, you know, sometimes it's nice to just stop, take a step back, and see the fruits of your labor in action. There's that serialized feel I mentioned. In Unity, this annotation allows you to expose private methods to the editor. Um, I'll be able to actually drag an image from the scene into this field and inject it into the class. And that image will be used to bootstrap a new heart. Right now this heart variable is in the update method, but soon I'm going to pull it up and, and make it a uh, class level property. So I'm using uh, Unity's built-in input class here to call get key down for both down arrow and up arrow. Um, if the up arrow, up arrow is uh, pressed, I'm going to call heart.replenish like I said. I'm just going to pass in one. And I'm going to do the same for the down arrow, but for the deplete method. Again, this is not supposed to be some robust test solution. This is just for my own gratification. And, um, you know, it, it's sometimes it's nice to just, like I said, take a step back and, and see what you've done and, and kind of do a little sanity check. Ensure it's doing what you expect. Also, that app class, um, as I start to dive into developing the heart container, which contains a list of hearts, um, I'm going to pretty much throw out all the code in that update method and replace it with uh, code more specific to the heart container. As I develop that class, I'm going to want to see that one in action. So this is completely a throwaway. And I've often called this file many things. Um, sometimes I'll call it scratch or throwaway, uh, but for the sake of this project I just called it the app class. So i um, fumbling around here but I'm going to use Resharper to uh, extract this local variable into um, a field. You see here, yep there it is. Uh, so now it's going to be able to be accessed in the update method and I'll be able to instantiate it in the start method. I don't want to I don't want to instantiate that on every update. That that's a huge memory hog. All right. So now all I need to do is add this app component to the scene and we should be ready to see what this looks like. This is a very simplified case. Um, in the future when we start adding animations and and playing with the uh, heart container, it, it'll be much more gratifying but there you go now we can just see I use the down arrow to make it deplete and use the up arrow to make it replenish and there it is that's what we've been working on for two parts in the next part we're gonna move on to fleshing out the heart container um, things are gonna get a little more complicated with our tests we're gonna see a lot of the same red green refactor cadence as we build on our class and uh, it should be very interesting to face some more challenges as now we have to deal with uh, the collaborators that the heart container are going to depend on. The heart container is going to depend on the heart and it'll be interesting to see how we test that and then how we actually get to see that in the the Unity player. So thanks for watching if you like this please feel free to comment and subscribe and like and share. Um, I was taking feedback for the last video and and I will continue to be taking feedback and developing this series with you guys as we move forward. Alright, thanks for watching.